You know, prayer is a gift to the church. It's a high privilege. And I think sometimes people enter into prayer and they don't get results. And then because they don't get results, prayer is such a small part of their lives and it's unfortunate. You don't have to be called to a life of prayer. Prayer is a great privilege given to every believer. The word says, Jesus said in Luke 18, one, men should always pray and not give up. Of course, I think it's the King James or one of the translations said men should always pray and never give up. And even a verse like that, I think, can be misconstrued that I should just keep at it no matter what. Well, as we taught during the Holy Week revival, if I'm not getting results, then maybe I need to adjust what I'm doing. So when he says men should always pray and not give up, I don't think he means to keep doing the same ineffective thing over and over. He's just saying to stay with it. I gave the illustration during the Holy Week revival of something that it took me 24 months, exactly 24 months to believe I received and to receive it. And another mistake people make is that they assume that the bigger the answer, the longer it's going to take to believe you receive. But I think that that is kind of a, uh, a misconception because I've seen God do amazing, huge miracles quick. And then sometimes little nuisance stuff takes a while to believe in. So when we enter into an endeavor to believe God for this or to believe God for that, it's a mistake to assume that if it's a bigger thing to us, it's going to take longer. You know, it's almost like we prejudice ourselves before we ever start out of the gate, and we, we shouldn't do that. Now, driving over here, uh, <laughs> a thought came to me that I don't think I've ever thought before, and I was meditating on the scriptures we're going to be in tonight, and this thought came to me that somehow... It's a mistake that we make to treat prayer like we're in a confessional or we're in therapy or we're talking to some kind of a psychological counselor. Because this thought came to me on the way over here. People make a mistake assuming that it doesn't matter what they say when they pray. Uh, Psalm 45.1, I believe it is, uh, Psalm 45, 1, and a lot of times my challenge is I remember things part in one translation and part in another. Psalm 45, 1 in the NIV, my heart is stirred by a noble theme as I recite my verses for the king. He says, my tongue is the pen of a skillful writer. King James says, ready writer. So David's idea of prayer was to recite his verses for the king. And so if we go to prayer, like we're talking to a counselor or we're in therapy or we're you know in a Roman Catholic confessional, well, what are we saying? You've heard me tell the story about thinking I was praying and I wasn't praying, I was complaining. So what are we accomplishing if we go before the Lord wrongly? Am I helping anybody? We said when we started this series that God and the Lord Jesus are one. God and his word are one. Jesus and the word are one. They're all one. So prayer ought to be holding up the word of God to the Father. And when he sees the word, he sees himself. And how can he deny himself? How can he deny his own word? So David said, I recite my verses for the king. Mark eleven twenty two, and Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God, for verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you what things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. So the believing I receive is tied up together with what I'm saying when I pray. Say it out loud. My believing, My believing 
I receive is tied up together with what I'm saying when I pray. So if we go to Father God and we're rehearsing the problem, what are we giving him to work with? If we go to Father God and we're rehearsing what the Corona News Network is saying, what are we giving Father God to work with? In other words, if we go to God in fear, what are we giving God to work with? We have to give him something to work with. And David said, I recite my verses for the king. In other words, David, by reciting the word to Father God, was giving Father God something to work with. And that's why you've heard us repeatedly say that we need to find two or three verses that cover our situation, whatever it is, commit them to memory. And one reason we want to commit them to memory is so that when we're praying, that's what's going to come out of our mouth, not whining, crying, complaining, or rehearsing to God the problem. One thing Kenneth Hagin used to teach that we ought to, <laughs> we ought to get it into our hearts and into our spirit, never repeat what the devil is saying. Tell your neighbor, don't ever repeat what the devil is saying. And, and, you know, what do you mean the devil? The devil's not talking to me. The devil's talking to you all the time. I mean, who do you think all those spam calls are from and texts are from? And you know what I'm saying? The news media and politicians, how do you know if they're lying? Their mouth is moving, the news media, all of it. A lot of it is just the devil talking. Amen. Amen. Fear, fear, fear. The whole thing is ridiculous. Amen. Amen. And uh, whatever it is. You know, what, what do they say? If, if it weren't for bad news, there'd be no news. Good news doesn't sell, bad news sells. So it's, there's no point in going, and you're not to go to God like you're the news media telling God what's going on as if he's ignorant and he doesn't know what's going on. The Lord knows what's going on. In fact, the Lord knows who the wizard is behind the curtain. All you see is the curtain. He knows everything about what's going on. You only see what they allow you to know about what's going on. So there's no point in going to prayer and telling the Lord what's going on. It's not like Twitter. You know, Father, I'm in line at Starbucks, you know, and they're making me stand six feet from the other person. Or, you know, that's, that's a waste of time. Where to go to God and rehearse to the Lord, be in agreement with the Word of God before the Lord instead of rehearsing our problem, because he knows what the problem is. <laughs> Whatever, if there is a problem, he knows what it is. So we're not, we're not supposed to be like, you know, the, the news uh, broadcaster to the Lord. Well, Lord, you know, this is going on, and this is going on, and that's going on. The Lord knows all that. So what we're supposed to do, what we ought to do when we pray is go before the Lord and give him some raw material to work with in our lives. And also to express our faith to him, when we rehearse his word to him, we're expressing our faith to him. So this may be going on, but I'm not going to talk about that. The Lord knows it. I'm going to say what God says about that situation. Amen? And be in agreement with the Lord. So all of us as believers should spend enough time in prayer to get acquainted with the Father. And you've heard us say repeatedly that it's not a matter of a certain time. You know, many years ago in 1985, I committed to a certain amount of time per day to pray. And I'm in the ministry full time. So I realize that people aren't in the ministry full time. They may not be able to give that amount of time to prayer every day. But pick a time. It's important to have a set time and stay with it. And then I, I know people, you know, it's like they, they never pray, then they want an all-night prayer meeting. And, but you'd be better off to pray 15 minutes a day, 365 days, and be committed to it and police yourself on it than to not pray all year and go to an all-night prayer meeting. Does that make sense? I mean, that'd be, like, that'd be like having a diet one day a year. What good is it going to do you to have a diet one day a year or to exercise one day a year? So consistency is more important than to have some outrageous amount of time and to be inconsistent. Same thing is true with everything we do before the Lord, reading the Bible. It's important to, have, to, pick, to pick a method and then to stay with it. My method is, I know I probably shouldn't say this, 
that, but I don't follow the church's reading program. All I do is I have the number of pages in the Bible that I'm reading, and I divide by 365. It's about eight pages, and that's what I do. And I do that, and I keep track of it. One thing I learned from Fred Price is to have rules for yourself and then to police yourself on the rules because nobody's going to do it for you. So, for example, there's, there's certain things I, I don't do, certain things I do. I don't travel alone. I don't meet with women uh, alone. Uh, you know, I pray so, so many minutes a day. I read so many pages in the Bible a day. I police myself on that. And these are habits. And if you haven't figured it out by now, the result of your life is based on the habits you establish in your life. So if you never get in the habit, for example, of saving money, you're not ever going to have any money. If you don't get in the habit of tithing, well, you're not ever going to have an investment in the kingdom of God. Because if we only give when we have extra left over, well, the devil will see to it we don't ever have any extra left over. So we have to discipline ourselves. And I know that's not a popular topic today in 2020. We have to discipline ourselves, set rules for ourselves, and then police ourselves. And even, even with regard to what time you go to bed, I mean, you know, if you, if you don't police yourself on what time you go to bed, how are you going to get up and seek the Lord early before the sun rises? So we have to set rules for ourselves and then we have to police ourselves because nobody, and, and gentlemen, it's not fair to have your wife do it. Because when she, if you task your wife with what, counting your calories, you're going to be mad at her all the time. So we have to police ourselves and not expect other people to do it. That's how we get ahead in life. And that's how we are consistent in our Bible reading and our devotional time to pick a time and then police yourself on it. Now, there's only two ways of getting acquainted with Father God, and that is through the Word and through prayer. That's the only way. That's the only way you can come to know who He is. And I am convinced that most Christians don't read the Bible. I'm convinced most Christians don't read the Bible annually because if you just read the Old Testament, you wouldn't do a lot of stuff people do. I mean, people wouldn't do a lot of stuff they do because... And then there's this thinking out there that the God of the Old Testament is somehow different than the God of the New Testament. This is total nonsense. He, he is the same God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So when we read the Word, we get to know Him. Did you know God has a temper? Did you know God has a temper? Did you know God can change His mind? You know, it wasn't that many weeks ago, maybe a couple of months back, I read that. The prophet of God goes in there to tell Hezekiah because of the way you did, because you, you divulged state secrets to the ambassador from uh, Babylonia, and because you showed the ambassador from Babylonia the temple of God and the treasures in the temple, that's it, you're done, you're going to die. And the prophet of God's walking out of the palace, and Hezekiah rolled over on his bed, and he repented before the Lord. And before the prophet got out the door, the Lord spoke to the prophet to go back and tell Hezekiah, all right, you got 15 more years. But see, if, if, if you don't read the word, all you know about the Bible is what you heard in church. And even whatever you're hearing at Faith Christian Center, you ought to go home and check it out. Amen? Amen? Because one thing this culture cannot do in 2020 is think for themselves. And we need to be able to think for ourselves. Amen. Amen. Amen? Critical thinking. To be able to think for ourselves. And the more you immerse yourself in the Word of God, the more you are going to be able to think for yourself. Say it out loud. The only way, the only way we can get to know Father God, know Father God is through the Word and through, prayer. and through prayer. So if you don't take time to prayer, to pray, well, you're losing out. If you don't take time to pray, you're missing out. You're missing out on what could be yours if you would but pray. And a lot of this I wish I had seen sooner. I mean, in my life, I hate to admit it, but in my life, 
Prayer was like a Lego block. It was a part of me, but it wasn't central. But now, as the years go by, what I hear in prayer is what I do. Then later I saw that that's how Jesus operated. He heard the Father. He did something. He saw the Father do something that would be with the eyes of the Spirit, and then he would do that. And so you can do things following the Lord in prayer that you cannot do any other way. And Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. When you discipline yourself to obey the leading of the Holy Spirit, actually what you're doing is you're training your recreated spirit man. And then every time you hear the Lord lead you to do this or lead you to do that and you take action on it, you actually become more adept at hearing that voice. And what happens is over time, amazing things begin to happen. Jesus himself said that he would send us the spirit to teach us all things. But how many believers, they just go through life like, you know, it's like a, a pinball. I don't know if you ever played pinball, but it's like a, a, a ball rolling around inside the machine, hitting stuff and bouncing off stuff. It's hit and miss, try and miss, hit and miss, try and miss. Well, we don't have to live like that. If we will discipline ourselves, if we will go to God daily in prayer and not just do all the talking, but listen and then take action on what he's leading us to do. And I have to clarify that I don't immediately take action on everything I'm impressed to do in prayer because Gene gets in the mix. And so what I'll do is I'll say to the Lord, if some impression comes to me, I'll say to the Lord, well, Lord, if that's you, you bring that back to me. And a lot of times it never comes back, and I know, well, that wasn't God, that was me. But then I gave the illustration last night. There was something the Lord brought up to me. It must have been 15 times over 10 days, a recollection of a conversation I had with a great father in the faith. Well, the way my mind, I'm not going to bring something up to myself 15 times in 10 days. That's got to be God. So then I take action on it. And the quicker you take action on it, once you are satisfied it's the Lord, the quicker you take action on it, then the greater the growth in your recreated spirit man. And this is just huge. It's just huge. This is one of the reasons this church walks in the prosperity it walks in, is because my policy is this, I pray and I obey. And the Lord, you know, people are, that's one reason people don't pray, because they don't want the Lord to tell them to do something. But once you get through that, once you get past that, and then also, it's probably a rare thing, relatively speaking. It's probably like a once a year thing or a twice a year thing that the Lord even tells me to do something. But you have to understand this about the Lord. He'll come along and tell you to do something just to see if you'll do it. And if it's financial, it's not about the money. It's to see if you will obey. It's to see if you will put him ahead of the dollar. And the, we get in our little thinking, well, I can't afford that. I can't do that. I already gave on Sunday or like we do when charities come by. I gave at the office uh, and we put God off. And every time we put God off financially, we don't realize that what we're actually doing is we're telling him we're not ready for the next level. But if we will learn to handle money correctly and if we will not be afraid, and that is a huge thing right there. I mean, look at the power fear has in 2020. Look at the power fear has in, you know, while everybody's out there rioting and looting, nobody talked about social distancing and none of that. But now that that's died down a little, well, they're right back on it. Fear, 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 fear. I mean, it's just, it's, para, it's paralyzing. And that's what Satan does to God's people. When the offering time comes, when the scripture's read from Malachi 3 about tithing, when the Lord speaks to people about uh, giving this or taking groceries to a neighbor or whatever it is, Satan's right there. You, you know, you have to count on him. One thing about him, he's a diligent sucker and he doesn't take any days off, no vacation days, no personal holidays, and he's diligent. And whatever the Lord's leading you to do, there will be opposition. 
Because Satan doesn't want you to get the prize. Satan doesn't want you to get the harvest. 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. So he will oppose it. Whatever God's telling you to do, he will, he will oppose it. Amen? Amen? Well, how does he do that, Pastor? Well, he does it through friends, relatives, Facebook people, all that. Uh, you just got, and, and, and listen, it's a mistake to go around telling people what the Lord told you to do. Because all you're doing is giving Satan opportunity to oppose whatever it is you think the Lord told you to do. Christina is here tonight. I, I'm, while I'm speaking, I'm reminiscing a game they used to have at the uh, Kukulkan Mall in Cancun. It was uh, in an arcade on the second floor. It's gone now. But it was a machine, and you had a hammer and you had these alligators popped up. So you hit the alligators as they pop up. Well, they keep popping, and that's the way Satan does. And so you get off the phone with somebody, and you handle that negativity. Well, then you got a text from somebody. Then there's that negativity. Then you get on social media, and then there's that negativity. That's the way Satan is. It's just, you know, it's like these alligators keep popping up, and you can keep, best thing to do is just get rid of all of that. Amen. Amen. I used to have a ringtone for a relative. It was from Lost in Space. Danger, danger, danger. <laughs> so you have to find some way to alert yourself to what's coming. <laughs> so you know how to handle it. Amen. Because you don't want to just grab your phone and, and hit the green button and then, you know, you're on the line with Satan. <laughs> Amen. 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 Whatever... God leads you to do through the written word of God or through a spoken word from the Holy Spirit or in the middle of a service, the middle of a sermon, whatever the Lord's speaking to you to do, Satan will send emissaries to you to talk you out of it because he doesn't want you to have the prize. He doesn't want you to get your answer. He doesn't want your prayer answered. He doesn't want your miracle to come to you. Acts 17, 28, for in him we live and move and have our being. I love getting out before the sun rises. I look at the moon and I, I, I think to myself, Abraham looked up and saw the same moon and I, I lift up my hands and I say, how majestic, O oh Lord, my God, is your name in all the earth. And then I say, because Satan's right there, I said, I'm not worshiping the moon. I'm not worshiping the sun and the moon and the stars. But I acknowledge that God put all of that up there for my enjoyment and to illuminate the night and to control the tides. How majestic is your name, O Lord, my God, in all the earth. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because when you look up, it ought to remind you how small your problems are. Amen. I mean, the God that set all of that up there, the God that, I mean, it is so precise. They know exactly when Haley's Comet's coming back. Uh, during the Holy Week revival, we had the biggest moon in I don't know how many months and the biggest moon for how many months to come. How do they know that? Then I read in the article that the moon that night was so many miles from Earth. How do they know that? They know it because it is all unbelievably precise. That's, that's our God. There's no chance to it. There's no luck to it. And so I just stand with him. I stand with him over the media. I stand with him over the news. I stand with him over what it looks like the bank statement says. I, I stand with him over what the doctor says. Amen. Amen. How majestic is your name, O Lord my God, in all the earth. So that keeps me in the perspective that God is greater than whatever I've got going on. Prayer is a call to fellowship with Father God and to love him as he has loved us. I mean, how would your marriage go if you never spent any time with your husband or your wife? I love you, but I'll, see you, I'll talk to you in three months. How would that go? Our love for Father God calls us to prayer. Prayer is the voice of faith to the Father. So when I go before Father God, I, just, I shouldn't just ramble and, and tell him what's going on like a newspaper or tell him everything that I... And, and listen... I've been saved coming up on 60 years now. I was baptized in the Holy Spirit maybe 55 years back or so. And not one time in all of that time has the Lord ever asked me how I felt about anything. So you need to take this whole cultural thing and flush it before you go to God. He's not, he's not interested in how you feel. How you feel. Now, even while I'm talking, you know, I'm getting some stink eye. So, but 
But how you feel, you know, in this culture out here, you know, two plus two, maybe it equals four, maybe it doesn't. How do you feel about that? But when you go to Father God, feelings have nothing to do with it. Your relationship with Father God is based on the Word of God. Amen. It's not based on how you feel. Because if you walk by feelings, Satan will see to it. You feel bad all the time. Right. It, I mean, and he's got all these emissaries to make you feel bad. Amen? Amen. It's not about how we feel. It's about what he has said. Say it out loud. Prayer, Prayer. is not about how I feel. Prayer, Prayer is about what God has said. So there's no point going to God and telling him, you know, you know, I feel a little blue today, Father. <laughs> I mean, literally, you may as well take a nap because that's not actually, actually, you'd be better off taking a nap because if you take a nap, you can't offend him. There's no point in going to God and telling him how you feel. No, the thing to do is to recite our verses for the king. I mean, this. You know, it's almost like the end of the culture. Therapy, this therapy, self-help, pop psychology thing is like the end of the culture. My daughter's sitting over here. She's got a master's in psychology, and I always ask her, how do you feel about that? You know, I mean, I'm proud she's got the master's in psychology, but it doesn't matter how you feel. I get up in the morning, you know, because I spoke last night, and then I didn't eat all day until after I spoke. And then Sue... Uh, had dinner for me after I spoke. So I got up this morning. I didn't feel all frisky. I felt really slow. But I'm not walking by how I feel. You know, I just doubled down on the coffee and went out and prayed. <laughs> Doesn't matter how I feel. I'm not walking by how I feel. Amen. 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 I'm 64 years old. Sometimes, you know, things creak while I'm praying. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I just keep going. Amen. Because I'm not walking by how I feel. I'm walking by the Word of God. And the Word of God says that I'm blessed when I come in and I'm blessed when I go out. And the Word of God says that with His stripes I have been healed. So I'm walking by the Word. And then as I take action on the Word, well, those little nuisance things, they just fall off. They just fall off. They go away. Amen. Amen. And I'm back to normal. But I can't walk. I can't go by how I feel. You know, I'm standing here on all this land and this building, and it's unbelievable what we did. I assure you I didn't do it by how I felt. <laughs> now, you have to, to do big things. you got to do big things by faith. Amen. Prayer is the living Word of God falling across lips of faith. Prayer is holding up the Word of God to Father God like a mirror because He and His Word are one. Through your prayer life, you become God's will in a Satan-ruled world. Through your prayer life, you become God's will in a Satan-ruled world. This world is being ruled by Satan. He is the little G-O-D of this world. You think God's in charge of this out here? No way. Paul called Satan the God, the little G-O-D of this world. And through your prayer life, you become God's will. Through your prayer life, you are taking Jesus' place. Through your prayer life, you are acting on his behalf. And once more, God is set loose among men. The Lord may lead you to pray for someone. The Lord may lead you to take groceries to someone. The Lord may lead you to send money to someone. The Lord may lead you. And this, this happens to me. As I get older, it happens more often. A lot of times... Because I filled my mind with the Word of God and I filled my life with prayer, a lot of times I just blurt stuff out. But I make sure I don't crawfish. Because if it just comes out of me, my assumption is it was the Lord. I'm talking about in being a blessing to somebody. So you remember that God gave to Adam dominion over all the earth. Let's go to Matthew 28. God gave Adam dominion over all the earth, and that dominion was restored to us through Jesus, but it is of no value to us unless we use that authority in his name. I mean, what, of, what good is authority if you never exercise it? That authority was given to an individual, Adam, but now that authority has been given to us as believers in the new covenant. 
Jesus exercised that dominion. He ruled the sea. He ruled the fish. He ruled the human body. He made arms grow where they had been withered. He fed the multitudes. Jesus did not exercise any authority or ability that is not latent in his name today. I mean, he said, go and do likewise. Someday there's going to be, rise a people who will take Jesus' place and bless humanity as Jesus blessed them in Galilee 2,000 years ago. Look at Matthew 28, 18. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. And really, those verses right there betray the strength or give the reason for the strength of Faith Christian Center. We don't just make converts. We make disciples. In two days on Friday morning, Saturday morning, the uh, champion builder groups will meet and men will be meeting with men as iron sharpens iron so one man sharpens another and without apology we teach people to obey the written word of God and so I mean somebody may wonder how come we skated I checked with one of the big mega churches up here in the northern side of the county, when they reopened, they reopened at about one third of 2019 attendance. I talked to the sons, the son of one of my fathers in the faith. When he reopened, he reopened at about one third of 2019 numbers. I was horrified because when we reopened here after the coronavirus fear and panic fest, we reopened at 80% of 2019. And I was horrified. And, and Austin, you know, of course, knows everything. He said, Well, check around. We we checked around and I, st I stopped complaining <laughs> and it was just Sunday I started seeing some senior citizens back because people self-regulate but I'm just saying part of the strength here that in the midst of all of that, in March, we, the church broke even. In April, the church broke even. In May, the church broke even. And we broke even while we're making all these big prepayments on this property. But the strength of the place is because of what Jesus said here. And we took action. We were doers of the word. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples. He didn't say go and win converts. He said go and make disciples of all nations, all nations, all nations, all nations, all nations. Faith Christian centers like heaven. Every nation, every kindred, every tribe, every tongue. Amen. And nobody's upset with anybody. Amen. Amen. So we built what he told us to build. And there's great power in actually just doing what he said to do. Amen? Amen? And teaching them to obey whatever you agree with that I've commanded you. Is that what he said? Is that what he said? No. Teach them to obey what they like. No. Teach them to obey what they're in agreement with. No. no, teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. So he is with us in the word, that living word. Say it out loud. He is with us in the word. He is with us in the word. And he is with us in his name. Say it out loud. He is with us in his name. He is and he is with us in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Say it out loud. He is with us, is with us. in the presence, the presence of the Holy, Spirit. the Holy Spirit. So when we pray, we join forces together with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that all authority was given to him as the head of the church. And it is for the church to use. And we are the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. That authority that is in the name of Jesus should be upon our lips. So when you pray for someone, pray in the name of Jesus. When you pray, don't pray to Jesus. You can always tell an immature person when they pray to Jesus. Now, I'm not saying you can't fellowship with Jesus, and I'm not saying you can't fellowship with the Holy Spirit. But when you pray, you pray to the Father because this is how the Lord Jesus taught us to pray in Mark, excuse me, in uh, John 14. You pray to Father God in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Amen? And then if you're, you're speaking to a pain in your body or you're praying for someone, you pray in the name of Jesus or you speak a word of command. That's John 16. You speak a word of command in the name of Jesus. Amen. And that's how we have authority. And all the authority that he used on planet Earth is latent in his name. 
But if we don't use that authority, how is that authority going to be released? In your daily prayer life and in your daily life, you should set that authority loose. How many of you have children in the home still? Let me see your hand if you have children in the home still. Well, they come up with issues. And uh, let me take a little two-minute side journey. The Lord has told me several times in my life to not complain about minor illnesses in my life or in my children and now in my grandchildren because he has told me on several occasions this is how he designed our bodies to build immunities. And so when children come down with this or that or the other, don't complain. Now, I'm not saying accept it. Pray for them. But don't complain about it because this is how God designed our bodies to build immunities. Amen. So what's going on in the United States of America is like the epitome of stupidity that we're supposed to go hide in a cave. If we go hide in a cave, we're not even given our body the ability to build immunity against this. And they say, wait for a, a vaccine. Are you aware that in the history of the world, in the history, because I read. Now, if you just watch TV, you don't know this. But in the history of the world, there has never been a vaccine, an effective vaccine created for a coronavirus. You know what a common cold is? Do you know what a common cold is? What is a common cold? It's a coronavirus. And my whole life, they've been working on a vaccine for a common cold. Are, do you know? Do you know what is the average effective rate of a flu vaccine that they come out with every year? What is, what is the effective rate of a flu vaccine when they give it to everybody? What is the effective rate? 15%. So in other words, if you hold your breath, hide in the cave, live in fear, live with the snakes, with a mask on, until they come out with a vaccine in 345 years, still it's only going to be 15% effective. Literally, they had to wait until 2020 for everybody to be this ignorant to roll this out. Because it took this many decades of dumbing down the public schools and the universities for them to get this to fly. We spent some days out on a dude ranch out south of Graham, Texas. You get around country people. Man, the restaurants are full. Nobody wearing a mask. You can't fool country people. <laughs> you know, it's an amazing thing. They understand that there's heifers and bulls. They don't believe in 72 genders. This is not like Baskin Robbins. <laughs> you can't fool country people. And so they understand some of this stuff. But city people, you know what they do? They watch TV. You know, and they get freaked the heck out. Amen. Hallelujah. There's a 99% chance you'll never get it. And if you get it, there's a 99% chance you'll survive it. Well, how, how, why can't we just use our faith to cover that itty-bitty little dab of possibility? Amen. 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 Amen? We're not even talking about big faith here to cover this. Amen. Amen. In Him, we live and move and have our being. Not in coronavirus. That's right. In Him. And if I'm in him, how can this stuff get to me? Psalm 91 says it won't even get inside my tent. Amen. Say it out loud. It won't even get inside my tent. It won't even get inside my tent. Amen. I mean, you remember how freaked out they had everybody about Amazon boxes? I mean, they had this country freaked out about Amazon. Look, I don't care if 15 lepers handle my Amazon box. When it comes inside my house, it is leprosy free because it ain't coming inside my tent. Amen. Literally, the world's nuts. And we are the only sane people left. 
He has made us his sons. Say it out loud. He has made us his sons. He has given us his name. Say it out loud. He has given us his name. He has given us his Holy Spirit. Say it out loud. He has given us his Holy Spirit. He has restored unto us all that Adam lost and more. Say it out loud. He has restored unto us all that Adam lost and more. We are Satan's rulers. Say it out loud. We are Satan's rulers. We are masters of demons. Say it out loud. We are masters of demons. We are masters of demons in every law that sin brought into being. Say it out loud. We are masters of demons in every law that sin brought into being. So how can you fail? How can you falter? How can you go broke? How can you even get sick? Say it out loud. My Lord Jesus, my Father God, always leads me in triumphal procession in Christ Jesus. Amen. I'm blessed when I come in. I'm blessed when I go out. First time I ever bought personalized plates. It was so funny. First, I bought that used car. Man, I was so down. I was so blue. Oh, my gosh. I mean, man, we were at the end. Man, we, were, it, we, we, we had three, four pages of accounts payable, single space at the church. I mean, we'd gone through the stock crash of 87. We moved into our first building, third Sunday of March, 1988. I mean, man, we were going, I mean, we were just weeks away. But I, I, st- I, I went back and refreshed myself on Fred Price, June 1988. We heard him at the Maybe Center in, at uh, Oral Roberts University. And I heard Fred Price, I went back, man, I went back. And I just, I I buckled down, man, I battened down the hatches and I I started saying what the word says about my life. All of my needs are met, all of my needs are met, all of my needs are met, the money is coming, the money is coming, the money is coming. Well, it didn't take too long for me to talk myself into it. So I went and bought a car. I went and bought a a one-year-old car, had 9,000 miles on it, factory warranty, still smelled new, and it had a cassette tape player in it. You don't know what that is, but I bought... I bought Dr. Price's 55-part series on the power of positive confession. And that's what I did because back in those days, it's not like today. Back, you know, now I got all these people. They do all this stuff for me. But back in those days, I, I went from hospital to hospital to hospital. We don't have anybody in the hospital anymore but in, unless they're having a baby. But anyway, in those days, I, I mean, I made my hospital visit. I'm listening to Fred Price, listening to Fred Price, you know, running errands. I used to go to Sam's for the church, do all that. I used to do all of it. I, amen. Those days are gone forever. Amen. And, uh, and I listened to Fred Price, listen to Fred Price. Amen. And, and I got to where I was, I was saying what the word says. And so I got me a set of personalized plates. They said, blessed. I think they're on one of Sue's vehicles now. And I took it to the car wash. And uh, the young man at the car wash, he looked at that back plate and he said, what does that mean? I said, that means I'm blessed. I said, come around to the front, see what the front says. And, and you know, he, <laughs> young people. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so we go around to the front, and I said, see what it says? He says, well, it says the same thing the back plate like does. You know, you know, what a wonderful world. And I said, yeah, it says I'm blessed. He said, what does that mean? I said, it means I'm blessed when I'm coming, and I'm blessed when I'm going. Amen. 